Samantha had asked her boyfriend, Dwayne, to pick her up after her shift at the common grounds. Dwayne looks around the parking lot and he doesn't see Samantha anywhere. He gets to her house, he goes up to the door, and her single father, James, answers the door. She's not here. I have no idea where she is. I haven't spoken to her. And they start texting and calling Samantha. Dwayne's phone lights up and it's a text message from Samantha. She's going to be with some friends for a couple of days and would he, Dwayne, let her father know where she was? And Samantha's father looks at it and he's thinking to himself, this is very uncharacteristic of Samantha. James went to the Anchorage Police Department and filed a missing person report for his only daughter. Police officers headed over to the Common Grounds coffee kiosk. Inside, underneath the counter, was a panic button that had not been pressed. The footage, which has no audio, it shows Samantha inside of the kiosk. She's working alone. And then at some point, someone that we can't see, they're outside of the camera's range, comes up to the window and orders a drink. She turns to give it to this person and immediately Samantha steps back and puts her arms up. And then second Seconds later, she reaches over and turns off the lights inside of the kiosk, and then she gets down on her knees with her back to the window. She slowly stands up and walks down the kiosk towards the cash register. She opens it up, she scoops some money out of it, and appears to hand it to a shadowy figure on the other side of the window. They reach down and they appear to tie Samantha's hands. He leaps through the window and then shuts the window behind him, and then he stands Samantha up, he puts a gun into her back, and then he marches her out the employee door to a white pickup truck where he puts her inside and they drive off. James had rallied the support of nearly all 300,000 people that lived in Anchorage to go out and look for his daughter. Three weeks after Samantha's gone missing and no one's heard from her, Dwayne got a text message from Samantha's phone and it was directing him to a particular sign inside of a nearby public park. It was actually a bulletin board and tacked on the bulletin board was a Ziploc bag inside of which was a typed ransom note and on the ransom note was a black and white photo of Samantha. And in this photo, Samantha looks kind of dazed, like she's got a blank expression, and she's not really looking at the camera, she's looking just to the side of the camera. And then in this picture, a man is holding a copy of the Anchorage Daily News newspaper that's dated February 13th, 2012. This was a proof of life photo. James was told to deposit $30,000 into his daughter's account immediately, and if he did that, she would be released six months later. As advised by the FBI, James deposited a portion of the ransom money into his daughter's account, and then the FBI FBI just waited and watched. A few days later, three separate withdrawals were made within Anchorage, but each time the FBI got a notification about one of these withdrawals, they would rush to the scene and whoever it was that had tried to make this withdrawal was long gone. The person that was making these withdrawals was a man wearing a ski mask and big sunglasses, so they had no way to identify him. From one of the Texas ATMs, they spotted the car this guy was getting into before he left, and it was a small sedan. The patrolman spotted the car sitting in a hotel parking a man in his 30s walked out of one of the hotel rooms, walked down and got inside the car. This patrolman just kind of followed him and looked for any reason to pull him over. He was going two miles per hour above the speed limit and so he pulled him over. The patrolman asked him for his license and the guy handed him an Alaskan license. His name was Israel Keys. He was 34 years old and he lived in Anchorage. The patrolman knew this was the guy. He called in backup and before long they were searching Keyes' car and in the trunk they found a ski mask, a gun, as well as Samantha's cell phone and debit card. After Keyes was arrested and was brought into custody, he denied having any involvement with Samantha's disappearance. But after being presented with the overwhelming evidence that suggested otherwise, he caved and said yes, he would tell them the full story of what happened to Samantha, but they had to get him an Americano coffee, a peanut butter Snickers, and a cigar. Once he had said items, he began to speak. And what he said was so disturbing and so graphic, the FBI still has not released the full transcript of his confession. He's decided he was going to rob the Common Grounds coffee kiosk. He walked up to the window, asked her for an Americano, and while she turned to make his drink, suddenly his plan changed. He decided he was going to steal Samantha from this coffee shop. When she turned back with his drink and handed it to him, he discreetly pulled his gun out and aimed it at her and told her this was a robbery. Once they were in the vehicle, he pulled the napkins out of her mouth and he told her if she tried to escape or if she tried to flag anybody down that he would just kill her. At some point, Keyes reached over and took her phone and sent that text message to her boyfriend. And then Keyes told Samantha he was going to be holding her hostage and trying to extract some ransom money. Then around midnight, Keyes made his way back to his house and he had her go in the back seat and lie down. Then he put some tarps over her and he told her if she tried to escape, he would kill her. And then Keyes got out and he walked inside of his house where his 10-year-old daughter and his girlfriend were fast asleep. And in just a few hours, Keyes and his daughter
daughter were scheduled to go to New Orleans for a two week long luxury cruise. Once inside, he sat her down on an upturned bucket in the back of the shed, and then he put a rope around her neck and he anchored each end of the rope to the wall so she was pinned to the wall. He turned on some space heaters to keep the space warm and then he left and locked the door. He walked back into his house and double checked that his daughter and his girlfriend were still asleep. Afterwards, he started drinking some wine and relaxing and then after a little while, he got a cup of water and he went back out to the shed. He went inside and he gave the water to Samantha and he said Samantha was very composed. She was obviously frightened, but she asked him, did you speak to my father? Did you figure out the ransom situation? And Keyes told her that, yes, I talked to your father. Everything's working out fine. He's going to raise the money. We're going to get you out of here. Everything's going exactly to plan. After that, he walked up to Samantha and he unscrewed the two anchors that were holding that rope up against her throat. And then he cut the zip ties on her wrist, allowing her to relax and sit forward and just kind of be at ease for a second. And it was very obvious that Samantha was relieved. Her nightmare was about to be over. But then seconds later, Keys grabbed her really aggressively and tied her up all over again, this time much more thoroughly and much more tightly. It had been a cruel trick. He was never going to let her go. There was no ransom. He had not spoken to her father. It was all a big lie. Keyes told investigators that as he was tying her up for that second time, he looked at her face and she had this look of total resignation. He said she knew what was about to happen to her. After Keyes tied her up, he left the shed and locked it behind him. He went inside to check one more time to make sure his 10 year old daughter and his girlfriend were still asleep when they were. He went back to the shed, he opened it up, he went inside and he began to assault her. After he was done, he was standing over her getting his clothes back on and Samantha very stoically looks up at him and says, are you going to kill me? And he says, yes, I am. As he put on his leather gloves, she tried to talk him out of it, but he said there was no other way. Shortly before 4 a.m., Keyes drove a knife into Samantha's back before choking her until she stopped moving. He told investigators that she never made a sound. After she was dead, Keyes left the shed and locked it behind him. He went into his house, he took a shower. Afterwards, he woke up his daughter and told her to start getting ready because they were leaving soon for the airport. While his daughter was getting ready, Keyes went back out to the shed, he went inside, he rolled Samantha's body up in a tarp and pushed her towards the back. He unplugged the space heaters, turned off the lights, turned off the music, and then double locked the shed and went back inside the house to make his daughter breakfast. At 5 a.m., a cab showed up at the house and Keyes and his daughter hopped inside and they made their way to the airport and then on to New Orleans where they went on their two week long vacation. After they got back, Keyes went inside of his shed. He unrolled Samantha from her tarp and by his account, she still looked fairly lively. And so he dressed her in some new clothes. He put lots of makeup on her face. He braided her hair and then he stitched her eyelids open. So it gave the impression she was alive and alert. And then he held up a copy of the Anchorage Daily News next to her and then took several photos creating that proof of life photo for the ransom note. After he took these pictures, he chopped her body up into pieces and then disposed of her in a nearby frozen lake. It would turn out Samantha was not Israel Keyes' first victim. He was in fact a serial killer who specifically preyed on completely random people because he enjoyed watching them die. Keyes told investigators that as soon as he saw Samantha inside of that coffee kiosk, instantly he knew he was going to kill her. Keyes admitted to killing Samantha as well as an older couple up in Vermont, but he would take his own life in a jail cell in December of 2012 before he named any of his other victims. And so to this day, we have no idea how many people he killed. The best guess is 11 based on a drawing he made in his jail cell, but that's just a guess.